All right. Did anyone get the second children's story we had today? There was a little girl who lost her way, and her sister came up and helped her up. That's what the church is all about. So we had two children's story. I hope you really listen to the last one. I want to begin with a reminder that you are the church of God here in Laguna Niguel as a Seventh-day Adventist church. And you have been set apart in Christ Jesus and you are called to be saints with all who in every place call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. It is a miracle, probably more than a miracle, there were miracles that led me to become a minister. Let me explain. I, my dad was not a churchgoer at all. When I was eight years old, he became a Christian and a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But my dad, and I don't mean this negatively, or I'm just telling you how it was. My dad, emotionally, he just didn't, wasn't equipped emotionally. Not that he had mental issues, he just wasn't equipped emotionally. He had, he had anger issues. He didn't know how to show love. I would bring a report card home with all A's, and he would notice that the teacher had checked off that I was talking too much in class, and I would receive a spanking from my report card. He never, whenever I did a chore around the house, there was never anything positive that, really that affirmed me, and so I really did develop a, a really bad case of low self-esteem. I went off to academy at 10 years old. It was my way of running away. We hadn't really learned any social graces other than please, thank you, and you're welcome. And so I didn't really have any friends when I was in high school. I'm not exaggerating. I had a friend that grew up down the street that I was friends with, but no real friends in academy. I went on to Andrews University, started developing some friendships there. And it was while I was there that a revival broke out. And I found out that Jesus loved me and God was not a harsh judge sitting up in heaven waiting to put his thumb on my life and squash it out. And while that, because of that revival, God, I believe, called me to ministry. And then when my senior year came around, I didn't have a call from any conference. And the Southeastern California Conference asked me to be a, a lay youth pastor, so to speak, at the church down in San Diego. And I was working with a pastor named Elwood Staff. And the conference asked him to move, and so he was on the conference committee. And so he said, before you do that, I've got somebody I think you should call into ministry. So I became a minister without ever interviewing for the job. Now, that may not sound like much, but I've never heard of another minister who didn't interview for the job. Time went on. After 21 years in ministry, and, and I did go to counseling for my low self-esteem, and I began to learn some things that really helped out. And one of the biggest things I learned was that I am the son of, a son of God. I am a child of God. And about 21 years after I was in the ministry, I kind of became burned out, and I was ready to quit. And then I was invited to something called The Journey, and while I was up at Pine Springs Ranch, God let me know he still wanted, was still calling me to be a pastor. Forward some, what, almost 30 more years. I didn't want to be an interim pastor anywhere. I wanted to stay home and be retired. But I believe God gave me a call and here I am. So you may be wondering, what's that all about? Please just know that basically what I'm trying to tell you is I didn't become a pastor because I had all kinds of natural skills and abilities and 
knew social graces and knew how to naturally get along with everyone. It's been a long journey for me, but God used me in spite of me, okay? I want you to keep that thought in mind. Today we're going to look at the invitation of a lifetime. The invitation of a lifetime. And it's an invitation that's given to all of us. And what we're really going to be looking at are the qualities for spiritual leadership. And the moment I mention spiritual leadership, there are some of you out there in your head saying, well, I guess I don't have to listen. I'm not a spiritual leader. Let me just say this at the outset. If you have said you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you said you trust him to be your Lord and Savior, he has called you to be a spiritual leader. It may not be in an upfront capacity, but he has called you to be a spiritual leader. And he has asked you to help invite others to be spiritual leaders too. That's an important point. So how do we know about this invitation of a lifetime? Today, we're going to look at when Jesus called the 12 disciples. We're going to look at when he called them and who were the disciples he called and how he called them and, and yes, even why he called them. But before we get into that, I want to mention that for many years, I was so wrong about how Jesus called the disciples. I didn't understand it at all. I'm not the only one because I was looking on the internet this week and you can find a variety of things people say about Jesus calling the disciples. Different timelines. I've gone through the Gospels and pieced together what I believe is the correct timeline, and I'm not trying to be arrogant in saying that. But I I had the thought, most of my ministry, that the call of the disciples came something like this. Jesus is walking along the beach. He sees some fishermen in a boat. They're working on their nets. He said, hey, fellas, come. Come follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. They said, okay, and they left their boats. This is at the beginning of his ministry, and that's the end of the story. They're called to be disciples. They stayed with him for three years. It's not how it happened. Let me tell you about when Jesus called the disciples. The Gospels reveal that Jesus called the disciples on seven different occasions. Seven different occasions that we know of. He called his disciples at different times and in different ways. Sometimes as Christians we get caught up in the Everything has to be the same, and we have to do things exactly the same way, and God works in the same way, and he never has. And so, we're going to look at this timeline of when Jesus called the disciples. And the first timeline is found in John chapter 1. And most people think that when it talks about John and John the Baptist and Jesus, it's talking about when he was baptized. That's not true. Because when Jesus was baptized, the Synoptic Gospels tell us that he went immediately out where? To to the wilderness to be tempted. And here it says that he comes back, that Jesus comes into John the Baptist's presence and he stays there for a day and John looks at him and says, hey, this is the Messiah. And I'd not thought about that until I was preparing the sermon before about this fact. It's no wonder Jesus came back. I mean, John had announced, hey, This is the Lamb of God who will take away. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. He's the Messiah. And then Jesus disappears for 40 days. Can you imagine how John felt? Did I make a mistake? Did I read the scriptures wrong? Was I listening to my own mind instead of listening to the Holy Spirit? I'm going to look like a fool. I announced him to be the Messiah, and no one knows where he went. And so Jesus, I believe, comes back. And he shows up so that John the Baptist would know that his ministry was correct. And John the Baptist once again announces that Jesus is the Messiah. Luke 1 says that the next day, the very next day, he's there and, and John interacts with him again and announces again to the crowd that who he is, he's the Messiah. And two of John's disciples, two men who were following John because they had a spiritual hunger, Peter, I mean, sorry, Andrew and John. They see Jesus walking away and, and they follow him. And Jesus turns and says, what, what is it you're looking for? He says, well, we want to know where you're staying. 
And, and Jesus said, well, come and see. Just come and see. If you want to know what I'm really about, come and be with me for a little bit, and you'll find out what I'm really like. And on the way to follow Jesus where he was, Andrew went and found his brother Peter and said, I found the Messiah, and, and he brought him along with him. And at, from 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there with Jesus, getting acquainted. The next day, Jesus goes out and finds Philip. And he says to Philip, follow me. And Philip does, and they spend some time together. And then Philip says, wait a minute, I've got a friend. And he goes and finds Nathaniel. And he tells him, we found the Messiah. And he tells him all about it. And Nathaniel follows Jesus too. Those are the first five of what would become the disciples to interact with Jesus. But then comes the moment on the beach. It's found in Matthew 4 and Mark 1 and, and Luke 5. And at that moment on the beach, Jesus calls the disciples. He says, look, and this time it's the same people, maybe with and the four people, Andrew and John and Peter and James. John's brother's now there. And he sees them fishing, sees them tending the nets. He says, look, come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. This is towards the beginning of his ministry. And they leave their nets. You see, we often think that when that happened, they didn't know Jesus. They just followed a stranger. That's not true. Jesus had already talked with at least three of them. And I'm sure John had told James what had taken place. And he talked all about Jesus to, John, to James. So th they knew who he was. And it says they left their nets and they left their fishing boats and they followed him. But even then, they didn't keep on following him day after day. When you read the gospel accounts, it seems very plain that they would be with him for a while. Then they'd go back home and they would fish or they'd do whatever they did when they went home. And then at a time which is almost, it's a little less than halfway through Jesus' three and a half years, then Jesus makes the official call to the 12 disciples. Oh, one more, I almost forgot. Before that happened, there was one other disciple Jesus called. He called Matthew, who was known as Levi, the tax collector. And some think this took place before the Sermon on the Mount, some this took place after. And I had to ask myself, like, why did he call Matthew all by himself? Very simple. If he called Matthew as the tax collector at the very beginning, no one would have accepted Matthew or Jesus. He was considered a traitor. He was considered a sinner. Why would anyone choose him to be a disciple? And so he calls Matthew all by himself when he's at his tax collecting booth, the place where he sins, calls him anyway. And then comes the time at the beach, found in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 1 and and, and uh, Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 5. And Jesus calls them and says, follow me. And they leave their nets and they follow him. But they still keep going out and coming and going. Then comes the official call one, about halfway through. It's found in Mark 3 and Luke 6. And we're going to look at Mark 3 at this time. And uh, Go ahead and read the, the, Mark 3. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that they might send them out to preach and to have the authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 that he appointed. Simon to which he gave the name Peter, James son of Zebedee and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Luke adds something interesting in Luke 6. Mark says that he was up on the mountain. Luke said that Jesus had stayed up all night praying before he called the disciples. He also adds in the verses after the naming of the disciples, he said that there was a great crowd of disciples there. We'll come to that in a moment. 
but there was a great crowd of the disciples. So these now become the official close-knit disciple group that Jesus is going to teach and train. But there are three more times when Jesus called the disciples. We, I gave a sermon on this when I first came. Remember, after the resurrection, Jesus met with the disciples on the seashore and reinstituted them, recalled them to be disciples. And then there's the great commission in Matthew 28 when he told them their task was to go and make disciples of all people. And then in Acts 1, he reminded them that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other ends of the world. So it is an important fact. And why do I bring this all up? about when he called them because sometimes I think we look back on when we first came to Jesus and we leave it there. Jesus is constantly calling us to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him. Jesus is constantly calling us, asking us to do things we thought we could never do because we didn't have the right gifts or talents. Jesus is often calling us when we think we need to give up. And he reminds us it's about him and not about us. Do do you catch the point I'm making? And so, we come to the fact of who did Jesus call? Who were the disciples that Jesus called? What's interesting, at least five of them were fishermen. There may have been a couple more. One, as we saw, was a tax collector. One was Simon the Zealot. Put those two together in a crowd, huh? Put those two together in a room planning the next steps of ministry. Notice that they put, Jesus called Judas Iscariot, who was a false disciple. Don't have time to talk about that issue. Why did he call these people? None of them were educated. None of them had tons of money. None of them had influence in Jerusalem. John may have had a little bit, but not much. None of them were of the type that, that would have a lot to offer Jesus. But they did have a spiritual desire. After all, Andrew and John were disciples of John the Baptist first, right? I think all of them had a desire for something more than just the religion of the day. Something more than a bunch of rules to follow. Something more than a rigid set of rituals that they had to take part in or they were in trouble. The something more was in following the Messiah, as we shall see. I came across something. Somebody became very creative, and so they, they put together this little announcement, this little letter that was supposedly sent to Jesus, son of Joseph. It's from the Jordan Management Consultants. Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. The profiles of all tests are included, and you will want to study each of them carefully. As part of our service, we make some general comments for your guidance. This additional insight is given as a result of staff consultation and comes without any additional charge. It is our opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, lacking in education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interests above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew had been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. 
He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely, Jordan Management Consultants. It was, to say the least, a motley crew that Jesus brought together, wouldn't you say? We'll come back to that. I, I want to look at the results of these men that Jesus called. What, what's interesting is that Jesus knew all their faults and called them anyway. Did you catch that? Jesus knew all their faults and called them anyway. And they didn't overcome all their faults by the time he was resurrected and ascended back to heaven. Paul had to get after Peter some time later for him falling back on some of his faults. That's okay, Barnabas got after Paul for him falling back on some of his faults, okay? But I want you to notice these 12 disciples. I, I, I've categorized them in four different color groups. The first in yellow are, are the the seven disciples that we know about how Jesus called them. And you can follow this in the Bible. You can go online. You can see this, okay? The second group are, are two men that we know something about. We don't know when they were called, but we know that about Judas Iscariot becoming the betrayer, and we know about Thomas saying to Jesus just before his death, show us the Father, and after his death, I won't believe unless I can see the scars in his hands and feet the wounds, but we know virtually nothing about Jude or Thaddeus. He's known both ways. We know nothing about Simon the Zealot other than he was a zealot. We know nothing about James the Lesser or Younger. And then what happened to all of them afterwards? The only ones we really know much about at all from the Bible is John. He wrote the gospel letters in Revelation. We know about Peter. He's prominent in the book of Acts, and so was John at the beginning of Acts, along with Peter. Peter wrote two letters. We know about James. He was the first who was martyred. And we know about Matthew because he wrote the book of Matthew. The others, other than what tradition teaches us and tells us, we know nothing about. And if you want to look up their, what tradition says, the Internet's filled with it. You can find it easily. And so, as you look at Jesus, not only did he call people that it seems that he called people that no one else would call, when you look at the results in terms of what we really know, there's a lot left that we don't know. But he called these disciples, and these disciples, I believe, other than with Judas, were faithful to the end. So now we come to the point of how did Jesus call these disciples? How did he call them? Well, Mark 3 gives us the answer. The first way he called them was, and I've already referred to it, this was so important that he spent the night in prayer praying about the spiritual leadership that he would leave behind. He spent the night in prayer making sure that he knew the ones that God wanted him to call not even necessary the ones he thought he should call. He spent the night in prayer submitting his will to God's will, asking God, who is it? Because as Luke 6, uh, 17 said, there was a great crowd of disciples he could have chosen from. They'd been following him, but he chose these 12 after spending a night in prayer to God. And then there was the way he called them on several occasions. He said, come, follow me. Come. That, that, that's an invitation. It wasn't a command. It was an invitation. Are you willing to come? Not only that, it, it told the ones he was calling of the great value he placed on them. I'm going to make you my disciples. Come. Come. I want you to come and be with me because I value you. I value what you can do. I don't see you for who you are now. I see you for what you will be through the grace and power of the Spirit. Come. An invitation. 
to become the person God created them to be. And then it was follow. Don't just come and say, I'm I'm with you, that's good enough. He said, follow, follow me, observe my ministry. See see the motives that operate. See how I go out in in prayer and talk to God constantly so that I know the mission he's given me for each day. See the motivations I have as I serve others, the compassion with which I do it, the care and the love. Came across something this week that just spoke volumes to me. I'd never put it together. Remember the upper room when Jesus tells Judas to go and do what he's going to do, knowing he's going to betray him. And the disciples, some of the disciples, think he's telling Judas to go take the money and buy something for the poor. Apparently, the compassion in Jesus' voice denied what, pe- what Judas was going to do. Do you catch my point? Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, said with compassion, go and do what you're going to do. I, I want you to notice that he asked him to observe how he, how he helped those who were downtrodden, how he ministered to those, and how he always pointed to God as his father. And then he said, please, come, follow me. That me is important. He didn't say, come, follow a philosophy of life. He didn't say, come, follow a doctrine. Not saying that's not important. He didn't say, come, follow moralistic ways. He didn't say, come, follow the crowd. He said, come, follow me. Bottom line, discipleship is focusing on Jesus and no one else. There is no one else under heaven by which man will be saved. And so, how Jesus called his disciples was through prayer. It was inviting them to come and follow him. But why did he call them? Called them for two reasons. He called them, Mark 3 says, to be with him. He just covered that. He didn't just call them to be with him while he was on this earth. He called them to be with him even after he ascended to heaven. That's why in John 15 he said, unless you abide in me, you will not bear fruit. That's why in John 15 he said numerous times, it's about abiding in me that will make your life meaningful. It's about abiding in me that will enable you to be the disciple I made you to be. He called them to be with him first. And then he called them to do ministry in his behalf, Mark says, to proclaim God's message and to serve others. You may, we may, we need to take note that being with Jesus must proceed serving others for Jesus. Do you catch that? Being with Jesus must precede our work for Jesus. You may ask Pastor Gary why this message. First of all, we're all, if you believe in Jesus, we're all disciples. We're all disciples. He's called all of us to come. He's invited us. He's called all of us to follow. His examples in Scripture are plain. He's invited all of us to come to him because there is no other way. But there's one more reason. We are getting ready to choose spiritual leaders for this church. And we must follow the process that Jesus followed. We may have ideas of who we think should be spiritual leaders, But we need to take time and pray and ask God who are the spiritual leaders he wants to lead this church. Did you follow that? That means saying not my will but yours be done. And I'm going to invite all of you to start praying every day that God will give us a sense as we go through this process of who he wants to be the spiritual leaders of this church moving forward. Because if we're not choosing who he wants, we're setting ourselves up for failure. What's interesting, and the reason 
I wanted you to hear this message as a reminder. I've already alluded to it, that the call to be a disciple is not just something that happens the moment we accept Jesus. The call to follow Jesus as his disciple, as his follower, is a lifelong call. It may take different forms, and you may serve in different ways. And there may be times, and often are times, when you feel God is calling you to a specific task or a specific ministry. But I would remind you that he didn't call you just to save you. He called you to become like him. I want to finish this message with a quote from Desire of Ages, page 297. He who called the fishermen of Galilee is still calling men and women to his service. And he is just as willing to manifest his power through us as through the first disciples. However imperfect and sinful we may be, the Lord holds out to us the offer of partnership with himself, of apprenticeship to Christ. He invites us to come under the divine instruction that uniting with Christ, we may work the works of God.